Praise the Lord. It's nice to be in the presence of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. It's nice to join. Uh, I just said this a while ago in the Iglo conference that it's always wonderful uh, to be in the presence of the Lord. But it's even more special to be in the presence of the Lord with His people. God does something incredible when His people come together to worship Him. Together. And that's a beautiful thing. I just thank God for uh, another privilege to be here at Calvary. And uh, for the privilege of being here and just worshiping with you all. And uh, probably the added privilege of actually sharing the Word of God with you this morning. I sometimes, when I came in, I sometimes feel a little overdressed today <laughs> with a coat. Probably that is, I would ascribe it to because for the past four days, out of habit, I've been asked to wear this coat. I have to be in a coat and a tie. I somehow quick gave up the tie. I've, and I, today morning when I was getting dressed, uh, somehow without just thinking, I put on the coat. Because four days I've been doing it. So forgive me if I'm a little overdressed for the occasion, right? Uh, but... It's a joy again to be here and to really share with you the Word of God. Uh, if, can, we, can you turn with me Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, down through verse 7. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know what they are doing, evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much busyness and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin. And do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase... And words grow many. There is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. Shall we just pray together? Father in heaven, we just want to come before you. Lord, we recognize that it is not we who just come before you, but it is you, O oh God, who summons us, who calls us to come into your very presence. It is you, O oh God, who has called us so that you can come and meet with us that you can have an audience with us, O oh God. Father, even as we have come this day, we pray that we will be able to understand, Father God, the very purpose to which you have called us. And that purpose is, Father, to worship you and to experience you, O oh God, in our lives and in this gathering while we are together with you. Father, we pray, let your word come forth with clarity. May, O oh Lord, it cut through our hearts. May it reveal the thoughts, the intents, and the motives of our heart. Lord, may it be laid plain before us. And we pray, Father, that you'd give us that sense of humility in our lives. That we will be able to receive, Lord, an encouragement, that rebuke that comes from your word. So that, Lord, we will apply it. And, Lord, that our lives will be fruitful increasingly. We just thank you, Lord, and we pray that you speak to us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. My message is actually entitled, The Worship Experience, Memorable or Mundane. The Worship Experience, Memorable or Mundane. When I was, an, when I was in the airplane flying into Sri Lanka, there was a thought that crossed my mind. Something that, yeah, that brought a smile to my face. I think this thought just came and said, people on an airplane and people in the pew have a lot in common. Are you with me? This just hit me. And I began to just think about these things. People in, the, in an airplane or people who take a journey 
in an airplane and people who come to worship God in the church or in a sanctuary have a lot in common. Now you might be wondering what so what what is the commonality between people on an airplane and people who come to worship God together? First of all, the commonality is that both these kinds of people are on a journey. We are all on a journey. People on an airplane are traveling. They're making this journey, and so are we who are in life making a journey with God. You will find in the airplane that most people are well-behaved and presentable. Wow, right? We have some of the best behavior that you see on an airplane. We become all so courteous, all so wonderful. You know, we just, when the air hostess welcomes you, like when I was getting to the airplane, the air hostess said, are you boa? Oh, wow. Even I bowed. You know, it's wonderful. We become very well behaved. Most people are. There are some, of course, exceptions to that rule, right? Some people doze off in that journey, right? Others actually, have you seen this? Some people are sleeping off even before the aircraft takes off. Some people are already dozing off, right? You see the airplane taking off and you're on this journey and you find a number of people are in a mindless trance. They're just looking. And you're wondering, what, what are they looking at? They just, they just have their eyes fixed on something. You don't know what. Some gaze out of the window, you know, as if to say that, well, we will see all that is there outside. You can only see clouds after you climb to about 30,000 feet, right? Most people, if not all people, are satisfied with the predictable experience of flying on an airplane and going on this journey from point A to B. For many people, the mark of a good flight and the mark of a good worship service or an experience is this. If you ask people, how was your flight? The answer will be nice. Nice. If you ask people as they go out of this time of meeting with God together with the people, they will say nice. It was good. It was nice. You will find that people on an airplane and people who come to worship God in the sanctuary exit the same way. We enter the airplane unmoved, unchanged, unaltered, and we are happy to take the next flight. Somehow, even the people of God, when they come in for, to meet with God, or as I said, God calling them to meet with Him, they come in, they are unmoved, unchanged, unaltered, and they exit the same way only to come back the next time. Hallelujah. Are you with me? If you enter a church sanctuary, take time to look at all the faces around you. You will find, like in the airplane, a few are giggling, right? A couple of people you might find are cranky, right? But by and large, you will find we are all content. Content to be there. Content to sit and look straight ahead. Content to leave when the service is over. Content to endure. Content with the mundane. Content with a nice service. That's why when we leave, you will say, wow, nice. But however, there are a few people who seek more. And those few leave with wide-eyed wonder of having experienced worship rather than merely endured worship. I am not talking about the wonderful people here. I am talking about people back in Abu Dhabi. Right? So, don't get upset with me or angry with me. Right? But the point is this. People come to meet with God. But you will find, probably even as you into two songs, people are already looking at the watch. It's more of enduring this two hours and now probably you're already thinking the preacher has a lot of time on his hand now. He's going to keep us and he's going to go on and on and on. Let me assure you, that's not what I intend to do. Because I don't believe in too many words. Amen? Are you experiencing 
worship in God or are you merely seeking to endure this time? The destination of worship is to meet and lift God up. And we all know, as in an airplane journey, we make a whole lot of preparations for that journey. How many of you have got up from your bed, straight up to bed, rolled out of bed, and actually taken and gone to the airport to catch a flight? I don't think any one of us would do that, right? And how many of us have arrived if your flight is at 10 a.m., have you have arrived at the church, uh, at the airport, sorry, <laughs> you've arrived at the airport at 9.50, right? You won't make that flight because we follow rules and we follow protocol, right? As with that journey that we will take on an airplane, we need to make preparations when we want to meet with God. It's so very important, Right? It's important that we would prepare ourselves as we go to meet God so that we can experience Him rather than endure worship. So the choice is between mundane and something which is memorable. So what does our flight check require? Travel demands preparation. So what are those travel checks or the travel preparations that we need to make as we journey in that place of coming to worship God. Solomon, writing thousands of years ago, he actually gave us some pre-flight instructions, right? There were no airplanes at that time, but he understood what it means to prepare, and he understood what it takes to come into the presence of God and the preparation that we need to make so that we can encounter the God of the universe when we come into his house. So I just like to remind us of a few pre-flight checks this, this morning as we come into the very presence of God. Solomon wrote in verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Another rendering of this verse reads this way, Watch your feet when you go to the house of God. Flight check number one, get ready or prepare yourself to meet God. That phrase, guard your steps, actually means that you proceed with reverence, tiptoeing into the presence of God. We come with care. We come with caution. We come with dignity. We come with respect. Many a times in our modern day world and the way we actually gather together, you will find a whole lot of these things are missing. It's something that we don't even give uh, think about nowadays. We can just roll out of bed and just put on anything and just come in without little or no preparation at all because we somehow think this is a matter of habit. I just need to go take this flight and then come back. Oh, it was nice. Next flight next week and we keep going on and on. We need to approach God with the same care as Moses when he encountered God in a burning bush and took off his shoes. He was on holy ground and he knew it. We might not be taking off. In our culture, the Indian one, and I believe in the Sri Lankan one as well, you know, we don't normally, we take our footwear out when we enter the house of someone or even into a sanctuary. Well, we might not do it physically now, but the point is we need to understand the spirit of it. It was showing a sense of dignity and respect and acknowledging the fact that we are coming to meet with someone who is the God of the universe. You know, when we, was to growing, when we, we were growing up, we would always remember our pastors telling us this, you know, right? No running in church. No running in church. The sanctuary is a place of reverence. Today, physically, we may not be running when we meet God, but spiritually, emotionally, and mentally, we are probably running around the whole place. So perhaps if you're listening to me, you're already thinking about the grocery list that you want to put on. 
or when you're singing, you're thinking about the little argument you had before coming to the service. We do church as many do lunch. So it's, it's like synonymous. Let's do church, let's do lunch. Casually and unprepared. Our hearts and minds don't show profound awe and respect. Some of you lost sight of the one into whose presence we are coming into. We don't anticipate God's presence or God's voice. How many of you be honest to yourselves as you walked in today through that door? You, when you left your house, you were saying, God, I want to experience you. I want to, there was a sense of anticipation in your heart, in your life, that you wanted to hear from God. How many of you are anticipating, saying, God, I want you to speak to my heart. I want, me to, I want, I want to experience you. Or you just walked in as if to going to the airport. Wow, we're coming here. Two hours and then we'll be flying out. Because there is no sense of anticipation or expectation as we come into the presence of God, we begin to understand that we are unable to experience the presence. So we'll, if someone will ask you outside, well, how was the service? Nice service. Nice service. What happened? Nothing. Nothing. Right? I believe Solomon is trying to tell us that as we come into the house of God or to meet with God, right, there has to be a sense of expectation and anticipation. The reason why God calls us to meet with Him is so that He can do something in our lives every time we come together. So I would like to encourage you, when you come to worship God, come prepared to meet with Him. I can remember there are people and their preparations of when they come before the, to the service or before to come to meet with God. Some of them get up. We have our services in Abu Dhabi in the afternoon. So there's a whole lot of time for a whole lot of folks in the morning. It's a good time. I can remember seeing a, few, a number of people. They, from the morning, they get up, lay around, and they watch a movie. Some watch one or two movies, and they fill their hearts with all those movie scenes, and then they are coming into the house of God to meet with God. Right? Or we're so busy with doing a whole number of things that our minds and our hearts are filled and flooded with all these things. And then we just walk in casually into the house of God and you expect that God would do something in your lives. I think you need to think again. When we were young, we were taught this. That when we wanted to go to meet God, we had to prepare ourselves. We had to really prepare ourselves. It's important that you would pray before you come so you will be ready to pray when you arrive here. It's important that you seek the face of God as an individual before you come to meet with people together so that you can pray together. If you're going to fill your heart with all the crap of the world before you even in your preparation, you're only going to come here and actually to be thinking about that when we are actually here to pray and to worship and to minister to the Lord. Some of us have services in the morning, right? Right, so I will, I will have this to say to you. Don't party until 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock on, on say, let's say, Saturday night so that when you come in, into the service, when you're with people, you're yawning half of the time or you're dozing off. Sleep before you come so you will stay alert when you arrive. This is not an airplane journey right? Read the word before you come so your heart will be soft that God can actually sow something that he would want to sow into your lives that day. Come with a hunger because when you're hungry, you will be filled. Come expecting God to speak. Come anticipating a memorable experience with the creator of the universe. Pre-flight check. Get ready to meet God. And you don't get ready in the car park of the sanctuary. You get ready hours before you leave your place. You have actually met with God alone. And when we come here, 
we meet with him or he meets with us together as his body. Just think about this, right? We always talk about, wow, we want to experience God. We want to uh, see a miracle. We want to have something memorable. But that will happen when we have put in the hard yards of preparing ourselves. You think about this. If you would change the way you prepare to go to the house of God, imagine there'll be something very different, distinct and memorable that God would do in your lives every time you come into the presence of God. Think about this. If you would, have got, you would have been home and you would pray and you would say, Lord, and you're really thinking about a number of things and bringing it to the Lord, you have tried to read his word and try to reflect on it, you are, your heart is already in tune with him. Imagine if all of you sitting on these seats here would do this. What do you think will happen? You're all in tune. And then God is able to. To do his work in our lives. God, or get ready, guard your steps. Get ready to meet God. The second thing that Solomon talks about is listen to God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know what they are doing evil. Now, the airplane journey, let's come back to it, okay, for a minute. You know, when you fly, I was looking at the flight attendants. I've thought about this a number of times in the airplane. Uh, the flight stewardesses would, you know, I really feel for them. They stand there. You know, in the earlier times when you would fly, you did not have these television screens. You only had this one screen and nothing used to come on that. And we had to rely on all instructions uh, that came from the stewardesses or the hostesses. I really feel for them because, you know, they stand there and they're giving us flight safety instructions. Are you with me? Right? Flight safety instructions before the plane takes off. And how many of you know that those are the most important instructions? And what do we do when the attendants are explaining how to use the seat belts, where the exits are, how to use the life jacket, how to put on the oxygen mask if needed? We know you will only understand the criticality of the information they are sharing when you, your plane begins to rock. That's the time you begin to think, oh, now, what do I do? Where is this oxygen mask going to drop off from? What, what am I going to do if I, suppose we have to land in water? Suppose our plane's going to crash. That's the time you begin to think. You know, when these people are explaining these instructions, most of the people on the plane are talking, reading, looking out of the window, getting stuff out of the cabin baggage, right? They're doing everything but listening. Now, let me, probably you might protest in your mind. You can't protest openly here, right? Because you have to hear me out. <laughs> right? But you might be protesting in your mind. But I've heard these instructions. Uh, how, I don't, I cannot even remember how many, how many times. Good. But the point is, even in the Word of God, the Word of God has so many things to tell us and how many times things are repeated. Many times when we look at repetition in Scripture, you know what we do, as I was saying a, a few days ago, is when we see something repeated, our tendency is to skip it. But when you come to the Scripture and see something that's repeated, God repeats it because that is important and there's emphasis on it. And we need to pay double close attention to what is repeated because there is something that God is trying to get our attention at and say, this is what I want to tell you. So instead of listening to these flight attendants and listening to what they have to say to us, we are doing a whole number of things. Everything but listening. And I can tell you, assure you one thing. These flight attendants know how God must be feeling. For sure. Just picture yourself standing there and trying to say, well, you know, you have an oxygen mask, come here, and they pull it this way, and they show you how to put the bell, and we are just not listening to them. They feel how God must be feeling when his people come to church or come into his sanctuary. I think God feels the same way as those people as well. Right? We show up at the sanctuary to meet with God and I have a mad dash from home. We're just trying to just, you know, kind of sneak in. Psst. 
right? World War Three has probably occurred in our in on the way on the way to the service, right? World War Three has occurred. Probably there's been a real bickering and some kind of argument between the spouses or probably the children and the parents. Right? We have, and that's what we're coming in with, right? And probably you have muttered a few choice words under your breath. Hallelujah. Not about you guys back there, right? You don't mutter anything. I know that, right? Then we stroll into the sanctuary as if we are strolling into a park and we find our seat, right? Then we take the bulletin. You know the bulletin? I don't know if you have a bulletin given to. We have a bulletin that is given out, right? And there's a particular area called sermon notes. Sermon notes. Now the beautiful thing is a few years back we did a survey in our church to find out what do the people do with the bulletin that they have. For one, we found out that most people never read it. To be honest, because in spite of all the announcements being made from the, from the podium, from the pulpit, and also being put, inserted in the bulletin, people don't know what, what is happening most of the time. Hallelujah. Not here, but there. Right? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> right? So we, the other thing we found out was they use the sermon notes not to really take down sermon notes, but they write the grossly, the list of groceries, to-do list. Our people have been very honest to tell us those things. So we've been contemplating for some time if we need to do away with the bulletin. But then there are some people who are so, they say, no, 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 this is hallow ground. You still need to get the bulletin going. All right? Because I just believe if something is not serving its purpose, what's the point of actually doing it anyway? Right? We stroll into the sanctuary we do the, we, and some people are very interesting. They were very honest to tell us that they're looking for typographical errors and other errors in the bulletin. They do typos, right? Hallelujah. And before we knew it, the preacher is preaching. And you're wondering, why didn't we sing those songs, which is your preference, right, this morning? And before we know it, because you're already way behind, you, the sermon is going on, and now you're probably thinking, why didn't we think uh, we are a dancing generation today? Some of you probably might be thinking, right? But before the service was over, our minds are somewhere else. We are not listening. Solomon offers further instructions for experiencing God in worship. Listen to him. Better, it's better to draw near in obedience than to offer the sacrifice as fools do. For they ignorantly do wrong. Now what he is talking about here is worshippers who go into the temple in those times or to worship God in the place where they meet with God and, they, and he's comparing them to fools. So in simple words he's saying he's talking about a worshipper who's likened to a fool. Why? Do not be hasty to speak and do not be impulsive to make a speech before God. Do not show haste to tell God a few things and do not be impulsive. Haste and being impulsive in the presence of God. He's saying is like a worshiper who's likened to a fool. The New Living Translation renders it this way. As you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Let's think about it for a moment. When we come to worship, we have to come to meet with God, the living God, and who has one agenda to meet with us. We have come to meet with God and we are well advised to let him do the talking. God wants to communicate with us. We need to ask ourselves, are we just coming and babbling of a few cliches and words that we are used to and that's all the talking we are doing wherein we are not even listening or wanting to listen what God would want to speak to us? We are so busy trying to tell him a whole lot of things that we don't have time to even listen to what 
he has to say. The same is probably true of the way we approach him when we come to seek him in prayer. There's something that I learned years before was called the discipline of silence in the presence of God. Most of the time, we are so used to, accustomed to talking. We rattle off our shopping list, our need list, everything is, we're telling, telling, talking, 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 and uh, it's like this, you know. You would want to tell God something, you come into His presence, and then you begin to go at breakneck speed, and then you rattle off all these things and say, oh, thank you, thank you, Lord, that you've heard my prayer in Jesus' name, and then you dash off. Right? How would you feel if you were in a conversation with someone and then this person would just rattle off all that he had to say to you and then you'd say, oh, well, I'm leaving without even waiting to listen to what you had to say. I believe the next time you will think twice before having a conversation with such a person. God feels that way because we approach him with our agenda in mind. But he says that's what fools do. We come before God because God has summoned to meet us, meet, meet, meet with us. And He has an agenda. And I think it would be wise on our part to listen to what He has to say rather than rattle off what we have to tell Him. The discipline of silence is about this. Over the years, even when I would seek God, I've learned and I enjoy this. Most of my prayer is now over the years, not about talking and telling God what I think, what I feel like, how I felt. Yes, that's good, but it's more listening to Him. It's more about listening to what He has to say about a situation. We may have a thousand opinions, a thousand ideas, but that's not what who God is. Listen to what God has to say. You, you may have a thousand opinions, but God's word is powerful. It's important that we listen to God. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Yeah? I'm not saying that you should listen to me, but listen to God. And if you walked in saying, well, let's just get over, I just want to endure this yeah, I know. Then you're wasting your time. And you're wasting the time of even others. Because you're not being a help, but an impediment and a distraction. Number three, Solomon continued, God is in heaven and you are on earth. Wow. So let your words be few. The third pre-flight check is humble yourself before God. Humble yourself before God. He said, God is in heaven and you are on earth. Now, this is a statement of perspective, not distance. So when Solomon is talking about God is in heaven, you are on earth, he's not trying to say that God is so many light years far away from us. It's not about distance. It's about perspective. God is in the realm of the infinite. He hears the inaudible. He sees the invisible. God penetrates that which is inaudible to human ears and peers into what is invisible to the human eyes. That's why you don't have to be saying, oh, so many words, flowery words, words you've picked up from here and there, even before you say or you even groan or you even say something. God from there is able to see that invisible groanings that you are actually, or the inaudible groanings that is going on in your lives. Or is seeing your situation, those things that are going on in your mind and in your heart. That's why Jesus in his advice or his counsel to the disciples said, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like those people who think they will be heard for the many words and the vain repetitions that you make. Many a times, you know, even preachers have this particular problem. Let me take a shot on myself, yeah? So you'll be happy. 
you know, they're preaching a sermon and they're, they're, the idea has gone out of the window. Probably they don't know what to say next. So there are fill-ins that we use. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And there are the phrases, praise the Lord, glory. That goes for also those who are leading singing many times. They don't know what to say. They haven't tuned themselves. So the one, the one go-to word, the one escape route is hallelujah, 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 praise the Lord. You're just saying it probably as a fill-in. But if you mean it, wonderful. But if you use it as a fill-in, it makes no sense. You're simply trying to repeat some words like many of the people in the world do when they repeat these mantras or slokas. It doesn't help in any way. God is able to see the invisible because He is in heaven. That's what Solomon is trying to say. Here's the point he's trying to make. God is God and we are not God. Hallelujah. God is in heaven and we are on earth. God is the Lord and we are his servants. And as we prepare to come before him and to experience him and to worship him, we must remember, we must approach this God in a posture of humility. We bow before him. We fall before him. If you and I will get a glimpse of who this real God is, then there is only one expression and one posture that we will have, and that is of awe, and that results in us falling down, kneeling down, bowing down in His presence. Nowadays we sing the song, we fall down and we are all standing. Hallelujah. Right? We kneel and you'll see everybody sitting down. I can excuse, and God excuses all those who are probably senior citizens and now have joint takes. They can always sit on chairs. But for all the other guys... You're not excused. You know why? If you know that he is God and you are not, he is God and we are servants, then there is one expression. We will bow. We will fall. Because he is God. Somehow we have become so casual we will just want to sit. I'm not saying that you must not sit. But the point is, you will make yourself nothing. And that is what that posture is all about. Expressing to God that He really is the one who matters. Look at Isaiah. When he experienced the presence of God, what happened to him? Very simple. We all know that, right? He saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne. His robe or his train filled the temple. When Isaiah was able to understand the glory and the magnanimity of this great God, when he was a prophet, by the way, before. If you read from chapters 1 to 5, he was a prophet, a man called by God to be his mouthpiece. But in chapter 6, there was a complete change in his perspective of who this God was. And the response, as in other places in Scripture, was one. He discovered himself, said, I am unclean, Lord. I need to be cleansed. His thing was just simple awe. And I think we need to learn at this time from even the people around us though they do not know the true and the living God, but in their lives and in their time, when they come to worship their deities, they will bow down. They will fall prostrate on the ground. They will not feel ashamed of it. Today we are ashamed of this great God. That's what Solomon says. Humble yourself before God. When you see God reigning in power, wisdom, and love, only one response is seen, that of awe. And one of the benefits of gaining a proper perspective of God is, not that, is that you not only gain a view of the throne of God and His glory, you gain a view from the throne of God. Those are two different things. When you are able to gain the view of the throne of God, or the majesty of God, 
your perspective changes. You also get a view from above. Once you've learned to enter into God's presence, we look on our world from His perspective. Right? Again, let's come back to the airplane. Right? We have a beautiful, uh, you know, kind of a building there which is tall. Right? For example, the Burj Khalifa is the tallest building in the world. Soon it will be usurped. That position will be usurped by another tower that's coming up in Saudi Arabia. Right? But the point is, if you're taking off from the airport in Dubai, you can see the, and you're driving to the airport, you will see the Burj Khalifa standing tall, right? And you will think, wow, what a structure, tall, wow, beautiful, so big, so huge. And then you take an airplane from the Dubai airport, and even as your plane takes off, you can see the tower. It's still huge, it's still big. It takes off another 10,000 feet. You can still probably, probably see a little bit of it. As you keep going higher and higher and higher, and then you begin to look down probably from 30,000 feet, you will not even see the tallest tower in the world. But the tower is still there. But you cannot see it because you have climbed to over 30,000 feet. And now your perspective is not the perspective as one who would be riding by this tower. But your perspective is one where you see it from the top and there is Burj Khalifa is no more to be seen. Hallelujah. Probably your problem, your struggle, your disappointment and all of these things may seem like a huge mountain as Mount Everest. But the moment you begin to humble yourself and you begin to get that view from the very throne of God, from His perspective, all of these things will begin to fade and a mountain will become a molehill. Humbling ourselves in the presence of God and finding perspective for life from the way, the way God sees things, right? will actually cause all of the things that we so inflate and talk about to become, to be reduced to its real size. Right? These things that we talk about so much and major on these things. You see, always our talk is, oh, I need healing, I need this, I, I break through and blah. We keep going with all these wonderful, no problem with that. But you're seeing all of it because you're seeing it from your perspective. Look at the God who is in the heavens. When he sees it, those are insignificant things in his eyes. He has more to do with our lives than just be able to provide and comfort us and strengthen us. He wants to form us into being like him. So humble yourself. That's why he says, God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Right? Worship is a time when we come into God's presence so we can see our difficulties and our rewards from his perspective. That will make all the difference in the world to your life. So think about this. Number four, pre-flight check. Mean what you say to God. <laughs> I said mean, it's not me, Solomon says that. Mean what you say to God. When you make a vow to God, don't delay fulfilling it because he does not delight in fools. Fulfill what you vow. Better that you do not vow than that you vow and not fulfill it. In other words, simple words, keep your word. Keep your pledge or keep what you promise him. Somehow words may not mean much to us, but they mean a whole lot to God, right? They mean a whole lot to God. In God's eyes, a word is a word. A promise is a promise. He vows 
what he says and he keeps his word. That's where the Bible says, God is not man that he would lie. You know what that means? <laughs> we are not God and we can lie. And we can go back on our word. We can go back on our promise. We can go back on our pledge. Right? Now I like you to consider for a moment the promises you have made to God when you were in worship. Think. I want you to consider the kind of things you have told God or said, God, 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 oh God, if you will get me out of this predicament, I will serve you. Anybody here who said that? Lord, just get me out of this problem and I promise, I vow that I will serve you. Lord, if you will just help me do this one thing, this one thing, not the one thing that Paul is talking about in the book of Philippians, all right? Just this one thing. I need to get this job, Lord, and or this particular breakthrough. I'm going to start coming to church more often. Hallelujah. Anyone said that? I don't know about you people, so I'm asking you. Yeah, you said many things to God. Oh, in that whole emotion, he said, God, you see, if you give me a raise and a promotion, then I'm going to start giving to you, God. The promotion has come, double promotion has come, but the giving has not yet come. Hallelujah. Hmm. Right? We promise a whole lot of things. We use a whole lot of words. And in the presence of God, we make a whole lot of promises. Lord, I rededicate my life to you. I promise to spend more time with you. Have you ever said this? Lord, I'm rededicating. I promise to spend time with you. One month has gone by and you've had little, very little time to spend with him. And so after one month, you'll again come and say, Lord, I rededicate my life to you. How many times are you going to rededicate and rededicate and rededicate your life? Finally, you'll get tired of it. And then after a while, you say, and there was no rededication anymore because there was no dedication in the first place. Yes, Lord, I will be a missionary and give up my life to go on the mission field. Anyone who said that to the Lord in, in, during a missions rally or a missions conference and said, well, Lord, I'm going to give my life to the work of mission. Yes, probably you've said that, but you are now going about your own mission. Or you have a lot of missions to take care of. So you are a man on a mission or a woman on a mission. But the only problem there is you have forgotten that you had vowed before God to go on his mission, not your mission. What promises with your time, your commitments, your life, your money have you made to God and not kept? When we make a commitment to God, we must keep it because God believes it and does not forget it. Hallelujah. You might forget it, but God remembers what you stole him in his presence. So when you come and we come into the presence of God to worship him, it would be better not to make a vow at all than to fail to keep your word with God. So don't be impulsive. Don't be hasty. That's what he says before. Don't be impulsive to say something to God because make, be sure what you say, he remembers. And so mean what you say and say what you mean to God. Five, and the last one. Finally, Take God seriously. Solomon concluded this section with these words. For many dreams bring futility or vanity. So do many words. So what is he saying? Many dreams, many words are just simple vanity or futility. They don't bear any fruit. Therefore, fear God. Fear God. It's a word that we hear or a phrase that is said. Fear God, fear God. And uh, we really think about it and we, uh, that's the most repeated, I think, phrase in Christendom today. Fear God. Fear God. 
right? And if you ask a whole lot of people, what does it mean to fear God? Perhaps as I speak, you ask yourself, what does it mean to fear God? It really does not mean that when you come into his presence, you shake and tremble. That's not what it means to fear God. To fear God is about having respect and reverence and holy awe. In other words, it is to take God seriously. He is God and I am not God. It is about acknowledging who he is and then aligning our lives in acknowledgement of who he is. And that means to fear God. So the question is, are you fearing God? There is nothing casual about this time that we spend together. So we cannot afford to just come casually. We need to think about seriously. Far too often we take God very, very lightly. Very, very lightly. He's taken for granted most of the time. We approach him in a very trite and casual fashion. Many of us, you know, because of many of the songs that are written nowadays, and many of these songs are very emotional, they only kind of kick up your emotions without really actually getting in the real, uh, the, 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 the real person of God into our lives. We even, there's a song, the song that we sing, you know, God is my friend, he is my friend, and he's my friend, he's my buddy, he's my pal, and then we get this idea that God is buddy, God is pal, and then you begin to treat him like a pal and a buddy. Indeed, it's he who said that I'm your friend. But the point is that does not change the fact that he is still the God of the universe. He is God. So we can't be buddy, buddy, buddy with him. We also need to understand, yes, he has that sense of a relationship that we can have with a friend, but he is far beyond and above that as well. He is God. He is the everlasting, eternal God, right, of the universe who has a claim on our lives because he has placed eternity within our hearts. It's important. That's why we need to approach him with reverence and respect. We get so casual. We play buddy, buddy, pal, pal with him. So everything goes, because with our friends, everything goes, right? So the whole idea is to help you feel, oh, you are a friend of God. So what does that mean, actually? You can take him for granted. That's not what it means. It's something that we need to. God does love. You might probably listen to me, might think that this God is a real angry God. He's not. God does love fun and laughter. He has wonderful humor. If you read the Bible, you'll find that out, right? He delights in people who have a sense of humor as well. But worship and coming before him is serious business. It's serious business. And that's why Solomon reminds us that we must take this time and our relationship with this God seriously. I remember the story of a young teenager who actually was going again, let me come back to the airport, right? We have landed now, or we're going to land now, soon. Right? The captain says, uh, cabin crew, take your seats, because we're going to land. So I also need to land the message now, all right? A little child, a teenager, was going with, with his parents to the airport, all right? And we, as we all know, we have to go through the screening process when we go to the airport, right? So this little girl, was this teenager, she was going through the security, and just in fun and humorously said do you to the to the security officer do you really think i have a gun in my bag this teenage girl is going through security and she jokingly very lightly humorously said do you really think i have a gun in my bag humorously just for fun in a flash in a flash She was whisked away. She was searched. She was questioned. And then she was scolded. They released her. And as she walked away from that experience, she learned something. That you should never walk through an airport security making jokes about guns. Entering God's presence is not 
a joking matter. It's serious business. Worship and experiencing God in worship is not an endurance contest. For many people, it's about endurance, enduring the time. But as any journey that we take, much more than any plane or any journey that we undertake, it's a marvelous adventure into the presence of the God of the universe. It is not business as usual, but a wonderful ride into a new dimension of life. It's a wonderful ride. It's not a mundane trip, and it never ought to be. God desires that when He meets with us, it will be a memorable experience. And when we would meet with Him and He would meet with us, we will not end up saying, nice service or a nice trip or a nice flight. But rather, if you can just think, probably many of you would have children and children who are small kids. And they, for the first time, the small kid, you actually took him into an aeroplane and he flew, right? And when he would land and come out, and if you would have ever asked him, how was your flight? You know what he would say? Awesome. Awesome. That's the experience. That's the experience that should be our story. It's an awesome journey. Every time, that, is, that ought to be our experience. It was awesome. Not the mundane, not the nice one, not the good trip. I pray, and I want to submit this to you. I pray that you will begin to think hard and reflect on his word. Right? That this is a serious business. We need to prepare ourselves even before we come together. We need to learn to humble ourselves. And a whole lot of that is seen through the way we posture, position, posture ourselves. We need to be, be serious about it. And we need to make sure that we don't say too many things in His presence. But rather, we will want to listen to what He would want to tell us. As we begin to live this out and practice this in our lives, I am sure that your worship experience from, will move from the mundane to the memorable. You'll have something to talk about. People around you will know that you have worshipped and you've met with God. Hallelujah.